Good evening, everyone. I'm Laura McCoy, and I'm a board member of the Baltimore Museum of Industry. We are so thrilled to welcome all of you to the second program in our Workplace Matters series, exploring contemporary issues in industry. Tonight, we'll hear a conversation with four local leaders about systematic racism in the workplace and what initiatives are underway to combat it, moderated by the esteemed Dr. Kay Whitehead. We are so pleased to partner with the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture on tonight's program. For those of you who are not yet familiar with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, our museum is inside a 19th century oyster cannery, and we are located on the waterfront just south of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. We are dedicated to telling the stories of the workers and entrepreneurs who built Baltimore into a manufacturing powerhouse. Programs like this are made possible thanks to the generous support of our members and donors. If you're currently a supporter, thank you. And if not, we encourage you to visit the BMI.org to learn more. A few bits of housekeeping before we begin tonight's presentation. This discussion is being recorded and will be posted on the museum's YouTube channel in the coming days. Your camera and microphone are turned off, but we welcome your participation. Please use the Q&A feature along the bottom of your screen to submit questions to the presenters. Let us know if you're having technical difficulties through the chat function. We anticipate this discussion will wrap up by 8 p.m. And now I'd like to hand the floor over to Wanda Draper, Executive Director of the Lewis Museum. Hi, everybody. I'm Ani from the BMI. I think we might be having a connectivity issue with our colleagues at the Lewis Museum. She is on her way to log in, so okay. I apologize for that. <laughs> okay. um, Dr. Whitehead, do you want to take it away? And panelists, would you like to turn on your uh, your cameras? And, um, and then when Wanda comes back, we can do a little bit more intros. Um, but just mix up the order just a little bit. Thanks. Not a problem, not a problem. I am excited to be here to join the conversation, uh, to help facilitate, to talk about an issue that we are struggling with really on two fronts. When we talk about systemic racism, that has been part of the conversation for a lot of people. It's these are new words that they're learning for the first time this year. They didn't understand or recognize or accept or realize that people are struggling under this dose of systemic racism and we're dealing with what is happening in the workplace. Uh, as we think about the way these two things come together, I think the best person to really take us into this conversation is the executive director of the Reginald F. Lewis Museum of Maryland African American History and Culture, Wanda Draper, one of my sheroes. So she has logged in. Wanda, let me have you. Let's step back so we can welcome you, welcome us into this circle right now. Good evening. I'm sorry, I was having some challenges. It was letting me in as a guest, but not as a panelist for some reason, but thank you. And uh, we're delighted to be partnering with the Baltimore Museum of Industry, particularly to talk about uh, this subject, because one of the things that we are all well aware of that our entire nation is now looking at the issue of systemic racism. And we're looking at these issues like we've never looked at them before. And that's why we're having this conversation tonight. And that's why we have the esteemed Dr. K here as our moderator. And BMI is looking at these issues and the Lewis Museum is looking at these issues. Tomorrow we are opening a new exhibit called Make Good Trouble, Marching for Protest because we are looking at these issues. You know, we, uh, we know that there's a long history of these issues, but now we are taking a very serious look at them. And tonight with policy experts uh, and people who can talk from their expertise and their experience, that we can have this discussion tonight. So we are so happy to be a part of this and so happy to have you join us. Thank you. Thank you, Wanda. I appreciate you welcoming us into the space and we look forward for, to what the Reginald Lewis Museum is doing in a, a COVID safe environment. We appreciate you. Uh, it was Angela Davis who said that sometimes we have to do the work 
even though we don't yet see a glimmer on the horizon that it's actually going to be possible. We do the work if we don't see the end. We just take that next step, confident that if the step is not there, we will create it on the way. The experts that we have assembled here tonight uh, we'll talk about how they are carving a path forward, whether it's through their own businesses, whether it's through working for major corporations, how they see systemic racism and the work kind of intersecting at this very crucial moment in time. I think it's important to note that we're only a few days away from the election and that if you want to be a part of the change in this country, then you have to vote. So we'll start off by asking each panelist to take two or three minutes and just frame how they come into the conversation. I want to uh, push it off to Ayadar Yira, who people know her work. Uh, she has a company, Yira Core Concepts, LLC. I hope I am saying the name of the company correctly. I'm excited about having her talk about what that means for her and how she sees this playing out in the Baltimore City area. Thank you. Thank you, Kay. And and um, thank you all for having me this evening. So I wanna um, just be clear, as, as you've stated, that this type of work has been going on for a long time, right? For, for more than 400 years. And it gets a lot of play now, but this is a generation's long journey and we are links in the chain. I come to this work with a very clear anti-racism, anti-oppression focus. A lot of times when people talk about DEI or, or REI um, or what, what um, um, EDI, whatever, they, they often think about that as if that is the analysis. When those terms are marketing terms and there are different types of analysis, about eight different types of analysis that, that fit in that. And um, my analysis is anti-racism, anti-oppression, A-R-A-O, which is a very deep analysis that, that really focuses on dismantling and transforming systems. So really being the, the, the institutions that we want to be, the systems that we want to be, the country that we want to be. In terms of workspace and, 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 and workplace, these conversations now are not the appetizer conversations or the side dish conversations that they were when I started out doing this work. These conversations are now the main dish conversations and they have to be taken as seriously as businesses take an audit. They have to be looked at as deliberately as businesses look at an audit. Because in our workplaces, when we're talking about the ability to recruit and to retain and to promote talent, we are talking about workplaces and workspaces where, where employees feel free to bring their whole selves in, whether that is racial, whether that is um, gender, whether that is class, disability, whatever. And, and if our businesses are not committed to creating and maintaining those types of workspaces where people can come in their wholeness, not as marginalized identities, then they will find themselves out of business in the 21st century. And when you look at a Maryland where the workforce age 40 and under are mostly people of color, 50% or more people of color, then you can see how crucial our not only um, um, taking a look at dipping our toe into, but really addressing and resolving these types of issues in our workplace, structural racism, white supremacy, anti-blackness. If we're not willing to take a look in the mirror and to figure out a new vision for our institutions, we will not be able to, to recruit or retain the talent that we need in order to grow. Adar, I actually want to follow up with you before we go on to, to Van Brooks. When you talk about this new vision, do you think this is something in the midst of this pandemic that we're dealing with, with particular emphasis on the Black and the Brown communities, could we actually create a new vision at this time? I, I think that if we look historically at, at every stage of the civil rights movement, and I want to keep this informal, so I don't want this to be a lecture, but when, when we look at every phase, we can see where there have been um, pivot moments like this in our history, right? And we can see where we have taken steps forward, and we can also see where those pivotal moments have been squandered. Um, 
so whether this is another pivotal, regardless of whether the moment is squandered or not, there still will be some progress. Whether that is, as people say, a, a moment or a movement, how far forward we go in terms of progress. You know what, Kay, that's up to all of us because each of us has a type of power that, that moves us further along. And oftentimes we think that we as individuals are powerless or that there has to be a groundswell of support. And if we look at like the third phase of this civil rights movement, what, what is called the, the King years or the King movement, what we see is that less than 25% of the country were in support of any type of racial equity policies, yet they still went through. That is just the small amount of, of vision and of people buying into a vision that it takes to make change. We have this opportunity here and, and whether it lasts um, or not, whether we believe that, it, that, that things can change, we stand on the shoulders of giants who did so much with so little. Who are we to do nothing or so little with what they have left us with, their legacy, which is way more than they had? So we stand between progress and our continuing business as usual. We are the vision. We have the capacity to, um, um, to make us better. And so I think that, that that question, each of us has to answer that for ourselves. And if we don't try, then we are part of the problem. We're part of the white supremacist structure if we do not try. Which definitely leads to our next panelist, Van Brooks from Safe Alternative Foundation for Education. Can you talk about what this would look like when we talk about systemic racism and the work and trying to be a part of the change that has to happen? What does that look like from your perspective? It looks like empowering the youth. Um, I work primarily is with middle school youth. And the, the work that we do is teaching the leadership skills and advocacy skills that they need now that they'll, they'll be able to develop as they grow older, that they'll take into the future to be able to um, have these conversations and step up and, and take things by the horns and, and, and create that change that we are fighting for right now. They'll be able to pick up that torch and carry it on. And the work that uh, we, we, we do with the middle school, tr it, it, it transfers in a sense of creating that pipeline that we will need. Um, creating the pipeline to um, having these uncomfortable conversations with their peers um, that are at the other schools who will also grow up to be future leaders and, and, and bridging those gaps at a much younger age, providing those experiences at a much younger age so that way when they do become older and they are carrying that torch for us, they are equipped and skilled to keep things growing and keep things moving forward. So as a follow-up to you, Mr. Brooks, we know that right now schools are considered to be one of the major battlegrounds um, with so many young people who are falling behind because of the technological gap. What can we do to transform the space so when schools do open back up, Black and Brown children have not lost a year or so of learning and instruction? That, that, that's, the, that's a major obstacle and fight that so many people are having. Um, the one thing that I can say for, for what we're doing in the community that we're in, we have been able to, I'm very big on ownership and in ownership uh, and owning our own spaces. When schools were closed, we were able to um, open up and allow our students to come in and uh, you know have access to the things that they need during these times, have access to the tutors and have access to the teachers and the technology that they need so they don't fall behind. I mean, that's a major fight that I have um, and, and conversations that I have with people all the time of how can we continue to own our own centers? How can we continue to um, own the, the equipment that we need to uh, support our young people um, right now? So that way, they, again, they don't fall behind um, as a result of uh, this, this time in the world and anything that may come up in the future. I want to ask those who are watching 
to join the conversation. If you have questions, uh, you have comments, put it in the Q&A section and I will share it. I know as we're listening to each of the panelists, things might be getting sparked. Go ahead and put in Q&A. Once we uh, get to our last panelist, I'll start asking your questions, which moves us on to Mr. Robert Matthews from Exelon Utilities. Can you talk to us about where, about where industry stands at this moment? We've talked about you know, in the private sector, we've talked about in schools, but where does big industry stand at this moment when so many people are losing their jobs, particularly black and brown people. Yeah, so good evening, uh, Dr. K. It's good to see you. Thanks for, um, for guiding us through it and, and to the fellow panelists, it's, it's good to be with you. Um, so again, as you said, Robert Matthews, I am a um, workforce development executive for Exelon and uh, chief of staff at Exelon Utilities. And so it's a good question. We have, um, um, at Exelon Utilities in particular, we saw as the pandemic started um, uh, and, and stay at home orders were uh, in, implemented, a uh, significant impact to our customers. Um, and, and so those who were impacted by loss of job and therefore income um, and their struggle to, to pay um, utility bills and the like, and, and as you mentioned, the disproportionate impact on, on black and brown communities. And so, you know, we, uh, as, a, as an industry rushed to, to ensure that we could suspend moratoriums and, and, and do what we could to support customers, ensure that we restored um, power where uh, it had been disconnected and, and suspended, uh, again, moratorium on, on, on disconnects and so forth. So we, we, we rushed to try to, to help. Um, we, we also um, made a commitment about to our own employees um, about uh, just continuing to work. We sent many home to, to work remotely, uh, about half of our workforce across our uh, 34,000 uh, company. Um, I think with respect to uh, systemic racism and the economic opportunities that we're here to discuss tonight, um, it's an important conversation that's happening. Uh, companies have been forced to to deal with um, where they stand on it. Um, I think companies who've been silent up till now on this topic um, have been forced to contend with, do you believe that Black Lives Matter? Um, and so companies are um, making statements about it and, and being held accountable. Um, where where Exelon stands, we, we have, uh, for years, and, and I think Adab pointed some of these things out, have been working to make a, a meaningful experience for our employees where they can bring their self, their whole selves to work um, and have an opportunity uh, to excel. We do recognize the institutional and the structural issues um, that have simply allowed some to prosper more than others and have been strategically um, working to dismantle some of those. And, and we know it, it impacts the full employee experience um, if they're allowed to excel and, and be selected for promotion, opportunities to develop and train um, representation across the leadership ranks and the like. It's, it's pervasive and, and been working to, um, to dismantle some of that. Um, it's a core business issue. This, this topic relates to the success of how uh, the, the, the ability for a company to be successful, uh, ensuring that um, employees have a, a meaningful experience, employee ensuring that customers are served in the most uh, uh, inclusive way so that uh, the customer experience represents um, the, the, the diversity that's there. And so um, companies can only be successful when they, when they look to address these issues and I'll look to share a few more examples uh, throughout the evening. So as a, a quick follow up to you, I mean, it, it's very clear that there probably is going to be no relief in sight. Um, there's probably not going to be any type of stimulus bill until maybe February if people start receiving that. Uh, given the fact that their unemployment is on the rise, Boeing is talking about laying off another 7,000 people. Uh, what do you think the impact is going to be on people who have asked for extensions and moratoriums and there's no relief? It may have to continue. Yeah, um, I, I think that what we've tried to, yeah, so the, this, the, the impact and the struggles are real. Um, what we've tried to do from our space, even as moratoriums have ended in some of our jurisdictions, still in place in several, 
um, we have tried to point out where there are benefits and programs and assistance available uh, for, for residents. And, and candidly, we see um, in normal course um, the, the benefits that are available um, through the various programs that customers don't take full advantage of those. And so what we have done in our um, in, uh, marketing efforts is to say, we need to be more active about communicating where these uh, benefits are, um, having uh, payment plans and, and programs. Um, the last resort is to, to, to leave uh, res our customers um, without the, the essential power they need. And so we're taking active affirmative steps to connect with customers, ensure that they are aware of the programs and are taking advantage of it. So we believe that there, there are opportunities uh, for, for customers to leverage. We wanna, we wanna share that in addition to what we're doing. And now I wanna bring in our final panelists before we open it up to some Q&A from the audience. Shrenavia Rocker is with Under Armour. Uh, can you run to armor seems to get stronger almost every year as more athletes become a part of, of the movement. And I noticed that Devin Allen, the photographer, is now working with Under Armour. So can you talk about what the impact has been with Under Armour trying to provide more space, perhaps, for people who are living in Baltimore City? Yeah. So again, Dr. Kate, thank you for, for guiding us tonight. And thanks to all the panelists. It's really great to be on the call this is really my actual first real introduction to uh, the Baltimore community. Um, you know, I came in to Under Armour last year and, uh, you know, spent this year in COVID. So we've all been in lockdown. So it's just really great um, uh, to meet everyone tonight. Um, but I'm glad that, that, that there was a period for me to just go deeper into the work we needed to do um, at Under Armour. I come into this work really uh, with a deep focus on um, purpose and values and really helping organizations understand why do you exist? And if you understand why you exist, what values drive the actions that you take? And when you're unclear about either one of those things, everything will go, can go. And so driving that from the lens of how do we attack systematic racism and how do we create spaces and places for um, the community where we, you know, I always say where we live, work and work out here in Baltimore, we have to acknowledge First step, uh, acknowledge where we are. And that means taking not so pretty, sometimes deep introspection and just saying the words out loud, right? And, and really acknowledging that we haven't done enough, um, that we, we've said a lot, there's been words, but have we really lived our values in everything that we do? Under Armour is a staple in this community. We're happy to be here. And because we're here, that also requires us to be not only good employers, but good corporate citizens. Um, and I will say that, you know, there's so many programs that we are invested in across the city, largely focused on um, education and, and, and getting teens and, and young people in the sport, into sport, but not just sport for the sake of dribbling and throwing balls, but building great leadership capabilities. And if we continue to do that, then we build great leaders for programs like the Van is, is supporting. Um, I think the other thing that we have to really take a critical look at and the work that we've already begun um, as we have what we call our acceleration strategy is what is our commitment to the organizations in Baltimore the, that are black run um, organizations that are really focused on um, advancing the black community here in Baltimore. And so we're focusing our attention on real tangible outcomes. We've laid out our strategy and plan. We've made it public because we want to be held accountable and I think that's what it's going to take. And, and it's not going to just take one company. It's about a coalition. So we have to do work with Exelon. We have to do work with uh, T. Rowe Price. We have to do work with all of the major employers in the city and all of the nonprofits. Everyone has to come together to figure out what is the best course of action for, for Baltimore. Uh, there's so many things to go after. Go after education, go after housing, go after the um, um, school to prison pipeline that we that is so pervasive here. I mean, we have so many big challenges, but what are we going to do together? Because what has not worked as effectively is all the disparate programs, all the disparate things we're doing. And so really building that coalition, but we always say it starts at home. And so we have a responsibility to this community. We uh, we, we just, I personally, I, I always laugh when people ask me the question is like, yeah, so you moved to Baltimore, what, you know, what do you think? And, and my, my husband and I are like, we love it because we know that this is a city that's on the brink of greatness and we wanna be a part of that. 
Uh, and that was one of the reasons that we came here to Under Armour. And I think, you know, for everyone that's on this call uh, today, we sit all in a very fortunate place and space to be able to have this conversation. Now it's really a matter of what are we gonna do about it and how are we gonna make the right investments, visible in investments and sustained investments over time. So with that in mind, I just want to kind of have one follow-up question for you, because I think about that there's a difference between being outward focused and being inward focused. So the plan that you shared is really the outward facing focus, right? What Under Armour is prepared to do within the community. Let's turn that inward facing for just a moment. Where does Under Armour inside of the building stand with systemic racism? I mean, how diverse are you? Like, what are you doing to actually confront this for your employees, whether you have employees of color or not, it still needs to be on the table. Yeah, great question. And, and it's one we talk about a lot. You will see, uh, you know, if, if you follow the company, you will see we haven't made this big kind of rule outside the company because I stand on one personal premise. Whatever is true needs to be true inside before you get to hollering outside, right? So if you can't have the consistency inside and that our teammates, more importantly, believes in it. And so when you think about our workforce overall, um, if when we think about the, the breakdown of the workforce, be about 49% of them, I'm not, I know my team is on the phone, 49% of the workforce is, is Black, Latina, um, Asian population of that percentage, 19% uh, Black, but in our corporate offices, and this is where we're, we're at, and our corporate office is only about 11 to 12 percent of that teammate population is black. And so we see a huge drop off in terms of broadly, uh, in terms of our distribution centers and retail. But when you get in the corporate office, we see that drop off. Now, although that drop off 12, you know, 12 percent, it's pretty much the national average, which you would probably expect. We also see and have been very transparent um, about the programs that we put in place internally to develop talent, to make sure that they can ascend to the highest ranks of this organization. Because what we were seeing is, of course, people kind of stuck at the lower level jobs. And so being very, very specific in our development, we've um, tripled our investment in teammate development, tripled uh, our, our leaders are held accountable through their compensation. If we don't make progress towards our diversity measures and goals in terms of, do you have representations at all levels of the organization? And we just you know, decided, this was last year when I came in, put your money where your mouth is. If we can't, um, you know, we, we can keep asking people to change, asking people to change, but what gets measured is what gets done. And we believe that bringing uh, visibility to the metrics uh, and holding people accountable is the most important thing we can do right now, in addition to making sure we're educating leaders and holding them, uh, holding them accountable. We, we have so much more work to do, but what, I, what I'm convinced by uh, that we'll make progress is that we have accountability measures in place that our board of directors uh, is down, I mean, just really focusing their attention on making sure we're held accountable. Our teammates are not gonna give us space um, to, you know, like, hey, shiny thing, great social media post, but what is the reality on the ground? And so uh, it's the continued work that we have to do. But again, we always say that it starts with um, transparency uh, and acknowledging where you are and then making sure that you really are focused on, on getting better and not just through words, but through real actions that can be measured. And so folks, now is that opportunity for you to put your questions and comments into the chat box. I have chat open, Q&A open. Uh, there's no need to step to a mic. You can just put them there and I'll read them out. Adara, I'll come back to you. Uh, Mary Maletti put a question on the floor that I wanna kind of work into the conversation because you know, Black Lives Matter is the thing to say now, right? You, you ride through Baltimore City and all kinds of neighborhoods, everybody has a Black Lives Matter sign. It's just very trendy to say that. Uh, but, but you and I both know that it's great to say Black Lives Matter when the cameras are on and it's even more difficult to push companies to actually make change and even more difficult to push individuals to make change. And so Mary wanted to know, what are some of the, the biggest obstacles or concerns that you have right now about trying to decrease the amount of systemic racism that's happening in the workforce? So, so one, of, one of my concerns is this, that now that this is the flavor of the month, number one, everybody and their mama is hanging a shingle out. Everybody's an expert now, even when they didn't know what systemic racism meant last week. 
right? Um, but this is the flavor of the month. And so people are going into it and that can cause incredible harm. And Dr. K, you know me and you know, I'm a pretty even killed person, but that, that um, potential for harm because people really don't know this space or what they're doing in it. Um, that, and, and when that harm takes place in, in your, your work environment, because it is usually the people in work environments who um, are in the most vulnerable positions, who are the ones who are speaking up to power. And, and without institutions understanding what they need to do structurally to help mitigate that or to help provide that safe space, um, then people are in danger or efforts are handled badly. And so people get turned off and then they say, well, we tried to do that and it really didn't work. The other thing that is of concern to me is how people are really co-opting terms. Because in lieu of an analysis, right? People use terms interchangeably, diversity, inclusion, equity. Um, and, and when we just talk diversity, that really is just cheeks in the seats. It says nothing about power. It says nothing about the way that power is being built, um, wielded or shared. It says nothing about the way that power operates within our institutions. And if we're not interrogating that, then basically what we're saying is, okay, we're gonna put a black face, an Asian American face, a Latinx face in these positions as long as they do business as usual. And then we'll be able to look and say, oh, look, 50% of our leadership are people of color. But if they are enacting the same business as usual that perpetuates systemic racism and racial inequities, then what does it matter? And people of color can be agents and, and, and supporters of white supremacist practices too. But because we don't have that deep analysis where we even are interrogating what is going on in our companies, our nonprofits, you know, and I love what you said about the outward facing focus as opposed to the inward facing. Companies are very big on talking about what we're going to do for you. But when was the community that they're doing for, when were they involved in that conversation? When were they brought to the table? What agency do they have in order to, um, to say, no, this isn't the plan? You know, we don't talk about those things. And, and so our lack of understanding what the work really means is really a huge barrier in our really dismantling and addressing and creating this new vision for more equitable policies and practices and organizational cultures um, um, in, in our institutions and in our city. So part of this new vision is also about training up the next crop of leaders. I think it's important that that's also a big point of disconnect. That is one thing to have these policies, but if we're not training young people early to take on these jobs, then they won't be prepared. So I want to come first to Robert and then to Shanavia. Um, to ask her this question, because Tony wanted to know, what about summer jobs for high school students? Are there jobs in place to help them get prepared to step into these leadership roles? Um, uh, th thanks, Dr. K. I, I feel like, um, uh, you know, we we've seen it modeled in the last few weeks. I feel like I have to say to the moderator, can I have 10 seconds to respond to Adar because it's been su su such meaningful information. Um, you're, you're right. I think what, what I've seen is um, the, the Black Lives Matter um, uh, the, the, and the companies being emboldened to say that lately. I think we have challenged ourselves, not just to say it, but what, what actions that we will associate with it and what change we'll bring. And I think this, this period has really also for, for many of, um, many of the, the, the black executives and, and colleagues and leaders that I work with um, who have been to some degree in this struggle for years trying to bring a change, um, it has allowed us to speak more boldly about that, what you mentioned, that power dynamic. 
Um, as many of you know, um, the former head of BGE, Calvin Butler, who's now CEO of Exelon Utilities, um, when, when he was at the utilities, um, it, it was about changing that dynamic. What, what would the business experience be? Um, uh, and, and, we, and the changes we made resulted in, um, again, to your point, uh, a, a change in diversity, but not just that, not just in the representation, um, but our business outcomes were um, history making when the diversity of our um, executive leadership team changed. Um, our diverse supply spin uh, exceeded what we thought it could be and limited ourselves. The employee experience uh, changed. And so uh, none of that necessarily of itself or of its own um, in systemic racism, but we do start to do the things that say, what is the experience? Um, what are the what are the barriers? Is it uh, is it um, the, the training, the selection? Um, you, you mentioned customer experience, um, and that's important. To what degree were we talking to the customers, and to what degree were we um, um, working for them and not working with them and discussing with them? So all good points that have been a part of the work we've done. Um, when we think about the external focus. We, we look at, at trying to address uh, economic inequities uh, in the, the, the underserved communities that uh, in, are in our neighborhoods and, and communities. Um, and summer jobs is a part of that. And so here's how we think about it. You know, the utilities that are part of my company, 50% or more um, include well-paying um, uh, technician jobs, craft jobs, mechanic jobs. And so we look back uh, maybe four or five years ago and say, we've got these well-paying jobs where people are benefiting for 40 year careers plus. And then there's Mervo um, in, in right in East Baltimore, Edmonton West Side, Green Street Academy, Carver, um, Baltimore City Carver. And these are trade schools that are training students in the very uh, trades and careers that feed into our um, program. And so as we tried to start addressing um, the, the pipeline and the inequities, we started to create partnerships with those schools, in which case we um, created internships where uh, in, in the interest of supplementing their, their academic work, where they're training to be electrical construction or plumbers and so forth, providing summer internships for consecutive years, support on the entry level, test to get in. And so since, um, uh, since uh, 2016, we've had um, increasing amount of interns every year, most recently 50 or so or summer from Baltimore City, and we've hired them into full-time jobs um, upward about 20 or so over the, the, last, uh, the last several years. So those programs still exist and we're trying to make a difference. We know we can't do it on our own, so the programs that we're leading, we're partnering with other companies to say, here's what we're doing. How can we make this uh, a bigger impact in our city? So I'm gonna come, come to Shanavia to answer that question about jobs uh, for young people. And then Van, I want you to stand by because we're gonna come to you to talk about, you know, what are some of the ways that you're dealing with training uh, in terms of confronting systemic racism? How is that next generation learning these terms so they can begin to help dismantle it? So first I'll go to Shanavia. Yes. So some of the work that we're, you know, we've launched and kicked off or rebringing back to life, of course, summer jobs didn't happen for many people um, this summer because we, we weren't physically in office and spaces, but it was about preparing and partnering with the, with the, with the school district uh, and with our community partners and making sure that we can provide meaningful assignments to students and not just, you know, them showing up or us not being fully participants, but programs, again, partnering with Boys and Girls Club, partnering with um, some of our other partners that do elite programs for us in the community is providing those with opportunities, not just for summer, but how do you convert those to higher, right? Whether that those teammates are going to call centers, our distribution houses, and then moving on to corporate level jobs, because it's not even just about hiring them in high school, but it's can you help them build careers over time? And one of the things that, that we continue to see as, as challenge is sustaining, sustained partnerships. Right. And, and companies really focusing and staying focused, I will say for Under Armour, you know, from a, from an organizational perspective, uh, you know, over the last several years, there's been um, we have not grown the business and we have not, you know, really um, been in a position um, to do everything that we would like to do. But I think the most important thing is what can we do? 
right? Because we still make enough money to invest in this community. And so are we investing in the right types of programs? And I would just say is partnerships are the most important things that we can do. Uh, and I would love to, um, to say that we have it right, but it really, again, takes a coalition and a village and you have to be committed. And, and what I have challenge what I'm what I continue to challenge our leadership team is are we committed to Baltimore and if we're committed to Baltimore this is what that should look like and here's the people that we need to engage to chart their own course right what does the city of Baltimore need from us versus what do we want to do for Baltimore um, and I think that continues to be one of the biggest challenges is not only just those intermediate hey here's some money for a job right now but are we building capabilities that sustain them over time to get people to higher wage paying jobs um, so they can really, you know, support their communities um, going forward. And so, Van, I want to come to you um, with the question around helping young people to deal with this. But Adar, I want you to get ready because I want to come to you next after Van, um, because we often talk about what Baltimore needs. We are in the midst of an election season. At the same time, we're in the midst of a global pandemic, which I call a syndemic for Black people because of all the levels of oppression and hostilities. So I want to ask you, what two or three things, based upon your experience and your knowledge of Baltimore from the ground up, what should we be doing? to change the reality of the situation here. Uh, but first I'll go to Van. Yeah, so first we, we, have to, we have to understand that our young people hear everything that's going on. They're not, they're, they're not blind to what's happening. They have questions and we have to give them a safe space to ask those questions. We have to give them a safe space to be able to get those things off of their chest and not, not, fit, not, not have them feel like they're gonna be judged by something that they may ask or something that they may say. And so that's the first step that we do. We, we, we let them know that everything that, that happens here is a safe space and we're gonna have those hard or uncomfortable conversations. We're gonna bring in, in the individuals um, and the professionals that they can speak with directly and have those conversations, right? We, we, around George Floyd, we brought in a lawyer to have know your rights training and that, for them to ask those questions, right? And in, in, in having those questions, you begin to see the clarity come to them. Now, once they have, ask those questions and they have an understanding of everything that's going on. You know, we just have to be frank and let them know uh, what the world, how the world sees us, right? How the world sees us and the fight that we have um, and the obligation that we have to be educated uh, in order to continue to move progress forward. Uh, have those frank conversations and, and, and equip them with, again, the advocacy skills, the leadership skills that they need to, to move forward while also teaching them, you know, when, when, when I'm getting into the workforce development space. I'm opening up, uh, I'm currently opening up a workforce development center that'll be open next year in, in my community. And a part of that um, came out of understanding uh, the, the, the things that our young people face and creating that pipeline and hearing employers say that people don't have soft skills, right? They don't have soft skills or they don't have the technical skills that are needed. But why can't we begin to teach middle schoolers or, or younger those soft skills? Why can't we begin to put them in the positions to receive some of those technical skills? You know, since I've launched my foundation, we've been running woodshop classes. Woodshop does a lot of things for our young people. It connects the dots between the classroom and the working world. It gives them those skills, but we also teach them the soft skills that they need in order to progress. So by the time they get to high school, they already have those skills. And then we, as long as we continue to stay with them or others continue to work with them on those things, we'll see them get better at it and we'll see the progress. So when we talk about the workforce development pipeline and we talk about the partnerships that have been, have been brought up with high schools, right? I've been seeing that a lot of our middle schoolers will pick a high school based off of where their friends or families, family members have gone, but not necessarily picking the high school based off of a, a career or a trade that they may have. We have P-TECH programs. We have all of these, these trades, um, trade schools that our young people have access to, but if they, they don't know that they're interested in any of those. So we have to give them those experiences at a much younger age. And then we are able to, just like how people say college, um, college choice or well, high school choice. Let's help our young people make the right decisions now in middle school by choosing the correct high school that will set them up to go into the careers that they are interested in instead of waiting until they're seniors, juniors or seniors, or waiting until they're graduating and then they're trying to figure it out. So for us, it's, I'm, I'm just a firm believer in teaching those soft skills and beginning to teach those technical skills at a much younger age. So for the, the, the corporations, the Under Armors, why, why not invite young people onto campus and say, here's a job 
if you're interested in this, you're interested in this, you're interested in this, here's the skills that you need, here are the things that you need to begin to work on now so that way they can understand or, or begin to develop a pathway to getting to that, point, that place. So Adora, I'm coming to you uh, with the question that was put on the table, but, but after you, I'm going to go to Mr. Matthews because uh, Shani had a question about how organizations can move forward with doing anti-racist training, anti-oppression training in the midst of an executive order threatening to take money away from that type of work. So, so what can we do in that environment? But first I'll come to you, Adora. Thank you. So I, I think that the the two things um, would be opportunity and access. And there are so many things that fall under those. And opportunity and access is different. Just because you have opportunity or just because an opportunity is there does not mean that you have access to it. And oftentimes we treat those things as if they're inter interchangeable. So under those buckets for me would be livable wages. Mm. You know, we, we often wonder why um, um, people, you know, why we have a problem with, with, um, with people committing crimes or with people in the streets or as some people famously say, looting, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we, we talk about outcomes and we never talk about root causes. We need to start addressing those root causes and stop just concentrating on the outcomes. We need accountability. We need accountability of leadership. We need accountability of our businesses. We need accountability of, of our politicians. We need accountability from our community leaders. We need transparency. The big things, K, Dr. K, is we also need resource development, right? We need more money for workforce training programs. We need affordable higher education, which does not um, require people from marginalized communities to hawk their whole future for a degree. We need affordable housing. We need investments in under-resourced um, and, and under-invested in communities. We need reform of a criminal injustice system because so many of our youth have both opportunity and access and their entire future snatched from them for, for misdeeds or missteps that white youth and white adults get second, third, fourth, and fifth chances for. We need all of that and all of that to me is under access and opportunity. All right, Mr. Matthews, I'll come to you. And, and once you answer that question, uh, Shanavi, I wanna come and ask you, because I know you're talking about Under Armour, but I also want you to think about the ways in which Under Armour can kind of bridge the gap to help other companies that perhaps don't have a foothold or a connection to the black community that maybe Under Armour has because they have provided so much sports you know, paraphernalia for schools in this city. So Mr. Matthews, I'll come to you first. Yeah, so um, thank you for that question. Um, it, it is uh, with regard to the executive order, it's, um, it, it impacts both, again, of course, government agencies, but also federal contractors, which many companies are. Um, and so I, I think the first thing we do um, is to make sure we vote and candidly hope we don't have to deal with this long. Mm. Um, so, so I'll leave it there, um, leave that part there. Um, in, in, the, in the meantime, we, we are actually um, being very creative. Um, um, for, for us, um, what the, the training that's happening is, is so far, um, we're so far down the road that um, it, it's, it's, it's like having conversations. And so um, you have to be creative about uh, uh, I think navigating what you can't say based on that order and what you can't focus on. Um, we tend to talk about what the employee experience is um, and what, um, what, what struggles or what things interrupt them from having an engaged experience, a meaningful experience. Um, and, and, and as long as we kind of take that route, we can talk about a lot of things. So I think it takes some creativity. Um, and then I think it also takes a little bit of um, leadership courage to say, I know what's important for my business um, and, and, and having the courage to say, hey, this is critical to us. I think um, 
we, we heard some companies say they're going to do what they need to do to lead. And I think that's important too. I'd also like to talk about uh, the investment. Um, as I mentioned, um, when I think about the whole of the Exxon uh, company, we, we've got four priorities around our workforce development, which is focused externally on, um, on, on economic inequity. One is STEM education, um, STEM awareness and education and access. Um, the barrier reduction, what we're doing in our internal policies and what we advocate for on the external uh, marketplace to break down barriers, opportunity creation and partnerships where we focus on to, I think, Van's point, um, you know, BGE created a partnership with Civic Works um, and, and, par and companies uh, in Baltimore, Ferguson Trenching, for example, and say there are they're returning citizens um, underserved um, how can we ensure they get family supporting wages? So we created an institute where they're getting training um, and work ready adults into family supporting careers. And so opportunity creation and partnerships and then the thought leadership we wanna add. So we're investing $10 million across um, uh, Exelon to do it. And it's not a new $10 million either. It didn't just start this year. It's been our investment over year, years because we want to try to make a difference in our, our community. And Shanavia, once I come to you, I just want to go back around to everyone. And Van, I'll start with you. But uh, we'd like you to just recommend a resource and this notion of each one teach one, a resource that you have used and that you would recommend that people then grab so they can talk about systemic racism in the workplace in all the environments that each one of our panelists come to. So I'll go to Shanavia first, and then I'll come to you, Van. Thanks, Dr. Kate. In terms of um, what can UA do um, to help other companies, I think um, I think we first acknowledge that there's so much more we should be doing. There's, again, so much more. Um, we focus on building stadiums, renovating schools, giving uniforms. But again, the most important things, are we changing lives? Are we helping uh, build the educational pipeline? Are we in the jobs that we have in this community? I think you heard me say it earlier, sustainable wages. So um, Adar talked about living wages, like understanding, are we, are, do our teammates themselves have what they need to live here in the city and live comfortably? Um, and then how do you take that education and through those programs? Because we have access. We have access across the, the city, uh, across the state and, and across the country and across the world for that matter. And so how do we use it to amplify that? How do we bring those programs to life in ways and more partnerships, um, meaningful, deeper partnerships? Because we can continue to do, I, guess, I pick on the team and call it fairy dust. You know, we can keep doing a lot of things, but where are we going deeply with kids? Because one of the things that we found when we spend time with kids um, is that they want to um, be one acknowledged for who they are as young people. Two, they want consistency because they may not always have consistency. So us showing up one time to do one program doesn't make a difference at all. It's about being consistent in the relationships that we build from a mentoring perspective and then partnering with other organizations. So partnering with, uh, we, we have a, a great, coalition with the particularly here, the Anna Harbor companies um, uh, on, on the things we can do together. But the most important thing is having a vision. And so, you know, we've talked a lot tonight about what is happening, but what is the vision um, and, and, and what are we all collectively walking towards? Because again, activity doesn't necessarily lead us to an outcome. And so really getting focused on what's the strategy for the city? What is the biggest needs in the city? We've identified some of them and who's going to go tackle what? Even if we divided the city up into segments and say, hey, they need this, they need that. We need to really figure this out um, because we can all talk ourselves into circles and we can talk about all the wonderful things that we're doing, but if they don't land well because they don't line up, it doesn't really matter. So I think the work we can do is really working with our partners, uh, working with the other corporations, working with our nonprofit partners um, to really focus on what is the need and where where, where does what we uniquely do as a company match that need and where we can uniquely play versus you know, the peanut butter approach. And, and so we can really get to outcome. And so I'll come to Van and then I'll go to Robert and then Adar and then back to you, Shanavia. We wanna get a resource from you because we do want to, in the last six minutes or so we have left, give people kind of a walk away. Van? Um, I'm, I'm an avid reader. So I'm gonna go to a book, um, Jeffrey Canada, whatever it takes. All right, Mr. Matthews. All right, uh, I've got two. One is Adar, clearly. Um, 
the, the second is um, um, one of the things that um, my company used was a, was a program called um, White Men as Full Diversity Partners. Um, and um, the, the White Men and Allies Learning Lab, it's a, for us, it was a three and a half day investment um, that, that dealt with um, white uh, su supremacy and white privilege um, as the core component uh, of our country um, and, 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 and how the implications of that were in our company. And, and, and through a, um, a very introspective, experiential um, three days, executives came to deal with who they were, where they were on their journey, um, what the issues were in the company. And, and so we, we had all of our executives go through that. We're moving down in the organization to our directors. It's been very tr transformational and it's caused us to focus on um, dealing with the realities of this um, in our company um, internally, as well as our strategies externally. Adar? So I would um, offer, and um, Robert, thank you for the shout out. I really appreciate it. Um, so um, a year of core concepts, we've worked with nonprofits and businesses as well as within communities. Um, this reiteration and, and the first iteration of my company, Core Concepts. And also um, I'm affiliated with and work with a group called Baltimore Racial Justice Action um, that also does trainings with, with community members and with institutions, helping them develop a, a great foundational framework um, in which they can begin not only to develop a racial equity lens, but also to develop systems, policies, and an organizational culture that is welcoming and more inclusive um, for everybody in the workplace. And, and if you'll give me like one more second, the other thing I would say is, again, analysis is everything. REI, EDI, DIE, whatever, those are marketing terms. Every institution operates from an EEOC. That's a legal framework. We have to operate from that. But, but in addition to that, there are um, um, frameworks, analytical frameworks, cultural competency, diversity, celebrating difference. Um, 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 healing and reconciliation. There are so many different analysis. And so e it is so important that each institution and each company figure out the analytical frame that they want to use for their company. If they don't do that, then they're just gonna do something generic that will look good on paper, but will not create the type of change they say that they want to see for their institution and for Baltimore as a whole. And then Shanae, maybe I'll come to you to answer the same question. We want to give people resources, kind of a, a walk away. Yeah. So, so two things. One, uh, like Van, I'm a reader, and so one of the one of the authors that I just simply I love, uh, if nothing else, because I think there's something in his work for everybody is is Dr. Um, Ibram Kende, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, and I think his work is important because it talks about not only the role that organizations play in systematic racism, but even the role as I, black woman, you know, what racism I bring to the table in my conversation, what I have done and have not done. Um, in my role in power. And so I think it was a, you know, for self-examination, also really, really good thinking on what systems um, and organizations can do as well. Uh, I think the other thing, and, and Adar uh, mentioned this, so I'm, I'm, I'm glad that there's alignment there in terms of uh, we're using a tool called the Intercultural Development Inventory. Um, and, and it really is an assessment tool to understand where you are. You know, it, it is the akin to, um, you know, some of the assessments that you can take online, but this is a validated assessment that really helps you understand where you are. And then we can coach and train leaders uh, to take it to the next level in, in terms of how they operate from a point of cultural competence. And then ultimately, if we can't see people moving along the cultural competence scale, then we need to help them find something else um, to do. And before I pass it over to Ani from BMI, I just want to put two resources on the table that I use. I know a lot of people are using Ibram's book, How to Be Anti-Racist. I would recommend people um, to actually step back and go to Angela Davis's work, who's actually one of the pioneers 
in anti-racist education. I know that, that Dr. Kendi has popularized the term, but this term goes back over 20 years when Angela Davis charged us to not just say we're against racism, but to practice anti-racism. Go and get Angela Davis's book, Women, Race, and Class, because I think that is where Dr. Kendi's book does not quite reach that level of bringing into it a gendered analysis rather than giving us new terms around what we should talk about as black women, let's go to the terms we've adopted for ourselves. So I, I would argue that, and I would also argue to put on table, because I think it's important to understand how this system works, is to go to Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow. I Jim think Crow. you don't really understand this system, so you understand the connection between slavery, sharecropping, and the rise of the mass industrial prison complex, and that explains how we got here today. So I'd like to put those two resources on the table. And I'd like to turn it back over to uh, BMI, Ani, to, to come back on and close us out. Thank you all so much for, for joining us for this conversation this evening. Um, I know we didn't get to everyone's questions. There's a lot, this is obviously a huge topic and one hour is not going to suffice. Um, we are looking, about, uh, looking at future programming. So if you have ideas or suggestions, I will be sending a survey link tomorrow and feel free to um, include your suggestions for future programming in there. And I just wanna say thanks again to all the panelists for joining us. I know this is just such a crazy busy time with the election upon us and everything going on in the news. So thank you all for taking time out of your schedules to have this conversation with us. So um, with that being said, I think that's it for the evening. Thanks again for joining and we hope to see you again in the future. Thank you. Everybody vote. Yes. <laughs>